fairly scapatici gravitated towards the provisional IRA, as did hundreds of other young people. It wasn't the free Ireland. You know, it was to protect their homes and their families against any further loyalist armed incursions. Freddie, what a city of 10 minutes left. After 10 minutes, kid, I can't do nothing for you. I'm trying my best for you here. You've five minutes, you've three minutes, you've two minutes, you've a minute. Think hard. But as Freddie said himself, nobody ever went home. I'm Nicola Talent, and you're listening to Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs, and the sins of the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. The intriguing story of IRA double agent Freddy Scapatici is one of mystery and fascination, and for years has been the subject of the Operation Canova investigation, due to be published in coming weeks. Today, I'm talking with author and former provisional IRA prisoner Richard O'Raw, whose book, Steak Knife's Dirty War, exposes British intelligence top and former, and his role in the IRA's nutting squad. He tells me about a narcissist who turned traitor and his sinister role as a notorious torturer who may have told his handlers who was going to live and who was going to die during Northern Ireland's dirty war. This is Crime World, a podcast from sundayworld.com. I'm Ricky O'Raw. Welcome to the podcast. We're going to talk about your book, about Scapatici who's uh, somebody, like, first of all, the name is, is uh, you know, co- co- conjures up uh, Italian restaurants, bowls of pasta and all the rest, and he was none of that. A fascinating character, and you've gone into great detail about who he was, what he did, and we're talking just as a report is due out, which you believe is going to just really put the cat among the pigeons as regards what went on. Well, we're talking about the Canova report, this was a report which was commissioned by originally by Barra McGrory, who was the public uh, director of public prosecutions for Northern Ireland. He directed the, 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 the PSNI to investigate allegations that uh, a British agent called Steakknife had been involved in multiple murders. And they then... They, they they appointed a guy called uh, Chief Constable, former Chief Constable of Bedfordshire called John Boucher to head up the report. And the report was known as the Canova Report. And it's due out, hopefully, within the next few weeks. Boucher has told family members the circumstances in which their loved ones died. And invariably, it appears that British intelligence agencies were fully aware that their loved ones was going to be shot dead and they had an opportunity to save their lives and they didn't do it. They let the IRA, they let internal security, a.k.a. the Nutton Squad, go ahead and have these people shot dead. And in the middle of that was said Scapatici. So we'll start with a bit of his background and you've done a huge amount of research into him. He died in the last... last in May. In May, yeah. Um. So what age was he, 70s? I think he was 70s, 77, 76, 77. Yeah. I've a note he was born in 1946 and uh, he sort of came of age, I suppose, as the troubles began. But a little bit about his background. Well, Scapatici, as, as you say, came from a, an Irish-Italian family. The original Scapatici's came here in around 1888 when there was a, when there was an, an immig- a whole swathe of Italians moving uh, west. Um, this was after political upheaval in Italy. So they all moved west. They all moved towards the British Age because the British Age was where the Industrial Revolution was occurring. They went to Bel- Some of them went to Belfast because it was a huge, hugely important industrial town and there was plenty of work. So the Scapatichis came here. They were hard-working Italian people. They, they, set, up, they set up businesses uh, they sold uh, they sold ice cream. They sold fish and chips, which was basically a traditional. But they also, they also were very skilled. They were skilled mosaic uh, pattern uh, makers, and and uh, they make they, they were very they were skilled um, artisans in terms of making statues and stuff for, for the for for the Catholic uh, community. The Catholics at that time were were flocking into Belfast as well from rural Ireland. Again, for the same reasons as the Italians were coming here, because there was work. Did they get rich? No, 
They didn't get rich, no. They but they, they. I mean, they had a good work ethic. I mean, um, and and then that was, and and Freddie Scapatici, the subject of the book, inherited that work ethic. Even when he when he was rich, when he had plenty of money, he went to work every morning. It was in his DNA to go to work. So he came from a family. He came from lovely parents, apparently. I I didn't know his parents, but I spoke to people from the markets area where Freddie lived. Who knew his parents? Who, who, uh, who had a great word for his, his mother was apparently an angel by all accounts, and his father was an ice cream man who very generously gave a lot of ice cream to the kids because the, the people I spoke to were kids in the, at the time. Um, so they they were well respected, and um, Freddie was. Freddie was your typical teenager growing up in the sixties. He was a, he was working as a as a bricklayer. He got he actually got a he was a good footballer. He got a he got an uh, he got a, a trial for Nottingham Forest, and he, he he it didn't work out for him. Apparently, he was a bit on the fat side, so they sent him back. <laughs> And Hans ended a great career, perhaps. He liked his past and his ice cream. Well, he must have. He certainly, he certainly, he was a wee tubby guy anyway, you know. Um, but um, he liked his past and his ice cream, and that around his, his football career. But apparently, he was a great footballer. And but he, he, he then he then took up an apprenticeship as a bricklayer, and he was a bricklayer for the rest of his life. And he was a typical working class guy. He, he, he got into scraps. He went to dances. He done all the things that somebody in working class Belfast or Dublin would do. They run around in wee gangs and stuff like that. Uh, this is before the troubles. There was no drugs really. There was um, you went for a drink on a Friday night or whatever. You went to the local dance. Somebody else, you the usual trouble, and that's what he did. He had a fairly uh, typical working class upbringing and. Um, and he had good parents. There was nothing wrong with him in, in terms of his rearing, you know, how he was reared. Given what we're going to talk about and what he did in his life, was there any darkness there in the background? Did you find anything unusual about, maybe not about his parents or his upbringing? Was there any sort of uh, whispers about him? Well, there weren't whispers. It was widely known that he loved porn- pornography. Um, everybody said this. Everyone that I, I I interviewed from the markets area, and and uh, you know anyone who had previous pre trouble and post trouble early experience of him said that he was he was a porn freak, and I uh, had cupboards full of porn, which was very unusual, you know. Um, and but again, you know. There was no warning signs given off that this could could be a dangerous guy. And that's probably only something we look now in hindsight, and we'll get on to that later about the the pornography. So by the time he's 25, I think he's involved in the IRA. How does that happen? Well, obviously, um, the IRA post-1969, and 1969 was a pivotal year because it was the year when the troubles actually broke out when there was, that's not just quite a program, but there was a huge uh, ethnic cleansing, you could almost call it, a purge against Catholics in Belfast. And whole Catholic streets were burnt on the 15th of August. People were running with their kids for their lives and behind them, their their houses were, were ablaze with loyalists coming down and armed beef specials. That was the police. Uh, covering them, and they were throwing petrol bombs. They burnt whole Catholic streets, so there was a, a, a huge shock to everyone. Um, and out of that, there emerged the provisional IRA, and Freddie Scapatici gravitated towards the provisional IRA, as did all, as did hundreds and hundreds of other young people who primarily wanted to be in a position to protect their homes and their families. That was the primary reason for most people joining the IRA. It wasn't, it wasn't the free Ireland. Mm. You know, it was to protect their homes and their families against any further loyalist arms and cushions. And um, so Freddie, and that was how Freddie gravitated towards the IRA. 
and he, he joined the IRA in the markets. He joined the provisional IRA. There was two IRAs at that stage. There was the, the official IRA and there was the provisional IRA. And Freddie went, the provisional IRA was always seen as the more militant. And Freddie joined the, uh, the provisionals and he was a natural leader. He was one of those guys who would walk into your room and would instantly command it. He, was, he just had this sort of a charisma, call it charisma, call it what you like, persona, but he, he was a natural leader. And within no time at all, he was the officer commanding the market survey of Belfast. And it was an important unit, be principally because it was in the city centre when the provisionals bombing campaign kicked off the market guys in the markets literally only had to walk around the corner and plant the bomb. So it was an important, it was an important unit and fairly was all of it. And he cultivated a, 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 a he, he, he looked after a, a fairly important IRA unit until uh, he was interned on the 9th of August, 1971, when internment was introduced. He was one of the first people interned and, um, and he was in and internment. He was in long cash. Uh, he was in long cash until, until I think it was the middle of nineteen seventy three or seventy four, at the start of it, and then he was released. He was released. The British didn't once they realised that how damaging internment was, in terms of their international profile. And in terms of it being a recruiting agent for the IRA, they were trying to get away from it. But the campaign kept regurgitating the same, you know, the same violence, the same, the same uh, upper, uh, operational intensity. So they couldn't really get away from it. So what they were doing was they were releasing individuals periodically, hoping that the releases and that themselves would have a, a calming effect. And they released Scapatiche. And within four or five months, he was OC of Belfast. He was the commanding officer of the IRA in Belfast. Now, you've described him as a charming character who could command a room, but presumably you need more qualities than that to become an OC. Well, Scapatiche wasn't a charming man. But, and I haven't described him, but he, he was far from charming. He was abrupt. He was punchy. Right, he. I mean, he would have thought nothing of being ignorant to people, and uh, he was an aggressive, weak guy in himself, and he could fight, and um, and he did fight. He, he was he was often in fights, and he was um, it was sort of. Here's one of the things about Scap. Scap didn't really drink that much, and a lot of IRA guys did drunk like fish. Now, whether so they have their own reasons for drinking, whether it was to, uh, to, 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 to calm down after operations, I don't know. But IRA guys tended to be pretty heavy drinkers. Scap didn't. Scap would have been into the pub with the guys. He'd have bought his round, and then he'd have sat over his paint while they guzzled paint after paint. And that gives you a certain advantage, because when everybody's drunk, and who's talking, you're sober as a judge, and you're able to watch the behavior of everyone else. So th that's the type of guy he was. He was calculating. And um, as I say, he was punchy. He had... He must have talked a good game, too, though, about his commitment to the cause. Oh, he did. He, he, he absolutely did. One of the guys I interviewed in Derry said, oh, he talked about operations as if he was on them every day, but he wasn't. He was... Uh, what the IRA used to call a squirrel. A squirrel was a guy who was involved with intelligence gathering. He was a squirrel. Then that, that, when he got out of when he got out of internment, finally, internment finally ended in December, uh, nineteen seventy five, and Scapatiti was held right to the end. Uh, he was reinterned. He was interned twice. He got out. He was OC at Belfast. He was caught and he was put back into internment caught by the British and put back in the internment and kept there until the very end. And he got out in December uh, 1975. And people detected that he wasn't the same scab. 
he hadn't got the same. He didn't seem to have the same. Are you talking the second one when he got out in 1984 or are you talking first? Uh, 85, he got, 85. sorry, no, 75, he got out. Mm-hmm. He got out of internment in 75. Termin ended in December 75. And people noticed that there was a change in him, that he didn't have the same. First time he got out, for example, here's, here, here's how you've been joking. First time he got out in 1973, 74, he reported back to the IRA within 24 hours, back to, on active service. When he got out the second time, he barely reported back at all. And people were saying, maybe Scap's not coming back. Maybe he's, maybe he's finished with the movement. He's finished with the struggle. He eventually did report back. And he was involved in... Um, he wasn't really involved in operations. He was involved in, as I say, intelligence matters. Don't even know it. Don't really know the degree to which he was involved with those. But he was... And um, he was floating around the Belfast Brigade at the Belfast Brigade level. And then Adams and Adams got out of prison in the round 77. And one of the, one of and he and he and he virtually took over took over the IRA. Restructured it. And restructured it. Yeah, but it wasn't just Cherry, it was other guys there as well. Brenton Cues had been Brenton Cues was still in jail in the dark. Ivor Bell, etc. There was a there was a, a sort of triumvirate. They were the triumvirate of guys who were advocating change, who were very, very uh critical of the old leadership of Billy McKee, Rory O'Brady, Dahi O'Connell, and guys like that. And it was like the, the, the press called them the Young Turks. So they came out and for whatever happened, they they took over the sort of day to day running of the IRA, and one of the one of the things that well Adams got out, one of the one of the priorities that they had was formation a special security unit to um, hunt down inf- informers and 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 kill them. That was uh, that was that was that was no no point making any bones about that. That's what the, the job of one of the part, one of the the primary primary um, objective of internal security was to hunt down informers and execute them. And so that unit was formed, and the, the heading up that unit in seventy eight was formed, uh, and the OC of it was a guy called John Joe McGee, who was who was an ex D company. D company was an old uh, was was a. a a company down the falls, very, very active in the early 70s. A lot of Brit- they killed a lot of British soldiers. And he, John Joe McGee, was ex special boat service uh, soldier for the British Army. He was a, a sort of a, an expert in, 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 in warfare. And under him, his, his number two was Freddie Scapatici. And so they set up their unit. And the unit was formed mainly from guys from their from D Company, from John Joe McGee's old company. And the job, their job, as I say, was to hunt down informers. And they went about it with great vigor. And they started, you, st- you know, then started to see bodies appearing on the border, all over the border. So we know that when he was interned, that he was offered early release, Scapatici, and he refused yeah. it. Yeah. Do we know that now, or did they know that then? No, no, that 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 was actually sent to me by uh, uh, a, a former British soldier um, who is who has who is very very good good researcher and um, well, it wasn't the her. This was another guy, a friend of Ed Maloney's. Ed Maloney, the journalist, and he sent to me this. He sent me this this. This official document where it is headed up the potential attorneys who would, who would be, who would swear an oath to dis, who would disavow the IRA, uh, and whereupon they could be released. And Freddie Scapatici's name was on it. And all he had to do was to say, "I'm not going back to the IRA," and he would have been released. And he didn't do it. 
He says, I want, I'm staying in jail. I'm not going to do that. So that wasn't one of the reasons he was chosen for the new unit. Um, did he boast about that? Did he ever talk about that? Never. I never heard of this. I, truth, I never heard of this until this uh, this this guy from England sent me the, the text. And, um, you know, it was a pretty amazing thing. So I'd that say to you, Ricky, that at that point then, that he was very committed? Absolutely. I mean, Freddie Scapatici, and, uh, you know, certainly wasn't in the employ of the British Army at that time. And he, I mean, so all he had to do was to put, a, put up his hand and say, I will not have any involvement with the IRA. And he was out the door in 10 minutes and he wouldn't do it. He says, I'll tell you what, I'm not doing it, I'm going to stay in. So that so bit that, of research, that document that you got as part of your research into yeah. the book, Allows you to cl- to to sh- to to close in on the time frame that mm-hmm. he did turn. Well, it's difficult to say when he turned, and it's difficult to say why he turned because the only people who have ever been definite about it have been the British Army, and I take everything they say with a bucket of salt. Because I mean, the talk is that he was well he was well torn by the time this unit was set up. And uh, and suddenly it, the the they called the press called it the Nutton Squad was set up and suddenly it he was well turned he was turned he'd already been turned by then and um one of the reasons why they say the British Army would tell you he was turned he was a walking and in other words he just walked in to the barracks uh, to the barracks and said look I I want to be an informer I want to help you fight the IRA I'm fairly scap a teacher I'm I'm IRA I'm an IRA officer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't accept that. And it's just too simple. And Freddie Scapatici, as you referred to there, Nicola, was a committed Republican. He, I mean, just two, a year or two earlier, he could have walked out a long cash if he disavowed the Republican movement, and he didn't do it. And he'd done three, three years, eight months, in internment, which is a long time. I mean, that's an eight-year sentence virtually to, to someone. If it had been before the court, you get 50% up here off your time. It, it, that's an eight-year sentence. And he, he, if he was, so if, if he had been turned, he, they'd have had him out a long time before that. So he was, he was a committed Republican. And I just don't accept that he walked into a barracks and says, I'm finished, let me help you. I'll shop my I'll shop my comrades. Something what happened. are the motivations for people to have turned? I mean, you know, not maybe focusing on Freddie Scapatici, but others. Was it financial? Was it a security thing? Well, there's one word that really sums it all up: blackmail. Most people who were turned were blackmailed into turning. They didn't. They didn't. Most most of them didn't most of the IRA volunteers that were turned uh, didn't want to be touts, didn't want to be informers, but they were caught in situations. And this was a thing that uh, British security intelligence officers did all the time. If someone was caught, for example, with a bomb and they thought that they could turn them, they'd say to them, look, we can, we can let you off with this. But you could do a couple of months in jail and then we can turn around and say that the evidence isn't there and, and get you out. Then you work for us. The alternative being you're going to get 20 years in jail. So there's a there's, there's a, a form of blackmail there. And then, so that was that was very, very prevalent. And there was also cases where IRA men were caught in compromising positions. Some IRA men may have been gay and they're caught with a guy. And they don't want their wives, or they don't want their families, or they don't want their community to know. There's a reason why they could be turned. Some of them could have been pedophiles. We know there was pedophiles within the IRA. Some of those guys could have been very easily turned. And because what we do know was that the Brits were doing were profiling IRA people. They were actively looking at their behavioural patterns, who they knocked about with, who they slept with, what their sexual habits were. Where did they get their money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they were always looking for the chink that would break someone, that would turn someone and have them working for them. So those are all the reasons why 
they 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 they'd have turned someone. So was the majority that sort of forced informer as opposed to the willing? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, that, that, well, okay, I don't know too many informers. Tell you the truth, probably no dozens of them, but just don't know their informers. <laughs> um, there's different levels, of course. I mean, well, some is. people don't have access to the kind of serious information that they would have no. been no. interested in. Well, you have ten pound, yeah, ten pound tights. There are people who live in estates, and they the eyes and the ears. They, if they they would look out, out the window and they'd see an IRA man walking up the street with a rifle, they'd be on the phone, and that would be the extent of their activities. They don't know. They wouldn't know command structures or nothing else, but they know to keep their eyes open, and their eyes and ears. And then as you, but they, they, they get to get the, to the, the upper echelons of the IRA, you have to have IRA people mm-hmm. doing the informant. So you, in the in the special branch, or you see special branch, and the the force uh, reaction unit used whatever means they could, and blackmail was primarily. They're, they're the source that they used. and I mean, it translates so sort of fluidly to modern organised crime, the drug gangs. You have the spotters who are paid a few bob yeah. who maybe owe a drug debt yeah. and they're able to give small pieces of information from within their community, but they know nothing about the command structure no. of the, the cartels or the big drug gangs. Somebody up higher, obviously, is a much more valuable source yeah. for, for law enforcement altogether. And... Many of them are caught in compromising situations. Are I mean, the same translates into the oh, into into the criminality. Into, of, of course, it does. I mean, the, the Brits are. The, they have to say this. The Brits are great at it. Mm. I mean, they had guys walking around the streets as pretending to be street uh, street uh, dust, dustbin men, and they were watching everything. And they they knew who they were watching. They were watching players. They were watching guys who were maybe setting up ambushes or setting up snipes or, or whatever. And um, they were very, very good at it. And they knew they were always looking for that weakness, that one weakness that turned you. And once they, ha- once they had that guy on board, he was gone. He was there on them. Going back to that, the nutting squad, and maybe describe how they began and what sort of things they were doing. Well... They they had their remit. Their primary remit was to, uh, was to chisel out informers within the ranks of the IRA, and um, were they after the small guys too? The ten pound touts. Everybody, mm-hmm. if someone was a tight, and you came to their attention, right, they would have you picked up. They would have uh, interrogated you. They'd have picked you up, they'd have took you to the house, depending on how serious you were, right? Uh, no matter how serious you were, if you were tightened, you could shot dead. It was as simple as that. And but they'd have they they'd have beat they beat people relentlessly. I mean Republicans are Republicans are are uh, reluctant to accept that, but they did. I, I mean I spoke to a lot here. One, one guy, I tried to get two or three others who were beaten to a pulp to, to talk, and they were even, they were scared. Mm-hmm. I mean, absolutely terrified. And they, they the guys that I know very well, and they were, they just said, I'm not going to run a record. Don't even think of it. And they were shit scared of fucking Scapatichi. Even though he was in England and had been in England for almost 20 years, they were shit scared of Scabatici. The name Scabatici was like was like someone putting a, a bit of glass, you know, rubbing glass on glass. It was so these guys were they didn't want to do it. One guy did. Yeah, he actually volunteered. He came to me and says, I, I want my story out there. I want people to know what happened to me. And I says, okay. That was Paddy McDade. And um but they were they were picking guys up, they were picking people up, and they were beating them to a pulp and they were extracting confessions out of them. And they were people were speaking in the tapes and they were saying that they informed in this and they informed in that, and then invariably they were shot dead. Mm-hmm. And 
right from the from the get go, Scapatici, for from the start of this unit, Scapatici was informing his handler uh, that John uh, Daly, John Daly, let's use that name, John Daly, we have him in forty three Compore Street. Um, there's me and there's John Joe, and he mentions another couple of guys. We have him there. He's, he's, he's confessed. This is what he had told us, Anna. He's going to be taken out tonight and he's going to be shot dead in Dunmore Street at 11, 9 o'clock. He'd have, passed, he'd have told his handler that. His handler would have passed that up up the lane to, and it would have eventually arrived at the desk of uh, an, the, the, an overarching intelligence group called the Tasking and Coordinating Group. These were the top guys. These were the top of Special Branch, the top of the Force Reaction Unit, MI5, and, uh, and E4A was a, a police unit that was like the SAS. They were, an, they were they would have actioned some operations, and there would have been a, an SAS involvement at that level as well. And they would have then made a decision whether or not an intervention was... Uh, appropriate or not, an intervention would have been, is a nice way of saying they would have sent the soldiers in to rescue the guy who was to be shot. It happened more, once or twice, but most of the time they just says, you know what, let him go. They they weighed up their options. They just says, what's more important here, Freddie or this guy, this ten pound tight or this guy here. Or what? Fuck, fuck him. Freddy's more important. Let him go. And obviously they would have also known the truth of whether the individual being captured and tortured was actually a tout. Oh, absolutely. They didn't, of course. They they had lists of touts, of course. That, that would have been all well documented. And it, it would have, I mean, not everyone who was shot by the, 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 uh, by the Nutton Squad were innocent. Some of them were uh, bona fide agents and weren't beaten up. Actually, one or two of them was quite proud of it. Right? And so they knew there was agents there. They knew that they were their agents was getting shot and they were happy enough with that. Well, happy enough is probably a bit too flippant. They were content to let the, the execution go ahead in order to keep Freddy Scapatici and whoever else was with him and any other agents that were involved in any way to keep them in place. I mean, it sounds a small amount of genocide going on there as well. I mean, when you stand back from it, we're not in those times now, but the power they must have had. Well, I, I, I've always had this vision of Six or seven guys sitting around a table, and there's a report there. There's a any conversation Freddie would have had with his honor, I have no doubt would have been recorded, and they'd have been listening to the recording. And probably they they'd have each had a transcript of what was said so that there was no ambiguity. They knew what was going to happen, they knew who, who they probably knew the name of the guy that was going to shoot the guy in the head. The, the 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 murderer again murderer killer executioner all these words you need to be careful with them because one man's murder is another man's freedom fighter and all that stuff but um they and they they'd have sat around the table they'd have had the transcript they'd have had the conversation that Freddie had with his handler and they'd have had all the facts relating to this imminent killing. And they would have said, um, no, don't think so. Let him go. Let him get shot. And Scapatici himself was very active in the killings and the torture. Oh, absolutely. Freddie was central to all of it. Freddie was the top interrogator. He was, a, he was probably... I mean, it was, it was said to me he was the top interrogator in the whole IRA. He had this, he had a he, he had ways of drawing people out and he had a good memory. He'd remembered what you said 40 minutes earlier 
And if you say it's something different, if there was any deviation from a previous account, he'd have been ready to pounce on you. But he also had a he also had a a, a way of of um, extracting confessions. He would have said to someone, um, "You've an hour in which to tell me everything." Now, if you tell me everything, I can talk to the army council, and the army council. They're not that bad. They're not bad guys. You know, they could let you go. If you don't talk to me, you'll be taken down to South Armagh. You'll be hung up upside down in a barn and you'll be skinned alive. And believe me, you can squeal all you want. Nobody's going to care because there'll nobody, nobody, be nobody within miles of this of this barn. And by the way, you'll tell us everything anyway. Now, you have an hour. And Freddie would have, he's just, and he says, I'm not even going to talk to you for this hour. Just want you to think about it. So the guy had been sitting there in a darkened room. All he would have heard was voices. And then as the hour coming, Freddie would have said, you've 10 minutes left. After 10 minutes, kid, I can't do nothing for you. I'm trying my best for you here. And then you've five minutes, you've three minutes, you've two minutes, you've a minute. Think hard. And sometimes that worked. But as Freddie said himself, nobody ever went home. And what sort of torture methods did he use? Um, Apart from well, the psychological torture of that. Well, there was beating, there was, there was the normal ones, the, beat, the beating ups, etc. But burning people with cigars and stuff was one of the methods that they used. Uh, one of the guys that, that's in the book, the Paddy McDade, Paddy was, Paddy was sent for and met, met, uh, two members of the of the Nutton Squad in Dundalk, and he was put into the boot of a car and driven down to a house in Charlesville, Ross Common, a wee farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. And he was put into a sleeping bag, and for three days he was made to defecate and piss in the sleeping bag, right? And what they did was lifted it up. Dropped him in the concrete floor, lifted him up, dropped him in the concrete floor, stood all over him, stood all over his genitals, right? Took him out of the bag, stood all over him, his face, his genitals, kicked him, punched him, put cigars out on him. Used him as a human ice tray. This is the sort of stuff that they did. Now, <clears throat> Polly McDade was a tough wee guy. And he was innocent. He wasn't a tight. And so he didn't break. So after three days of this, three days, and he never slept for three days. He never had any, they never gave him any food. There was no, uh, no drinks of water or nothing. It was three days of total deprivation and total and absolute uh, torture. And there was no sleep. This didn't just knock off at five o'clock. This went on right through the night. And after three days, it says he must be innocent. And they released him. They actually brought him down. He had a fiver or something. They give him a, they give him a fiver and brought him down to the bus stop and said, fuck off. Did you describe Scapatici's demeanour during that time? Well, Scapatici, he wasn't sure Scapatici was there. Right? And he, he, he knew two of the guys that was there. And he was hooded. He was a hooded man. For the three days, I never took the hood off him, you see. So, and he never heard Scapatici's voice. He knew Scap, he knew Scap well. But he wasn't sure if he was there. Oh, he, he had a suspicion that he was overseeing it because he, him and Scapatici knew each other very well. And he's suspicion that Scap didn't want him to know he was there, even though he was. But um, uh, that's what happened to Patty. And that's what happened to a lot of guys. I know for a fact, I know for a fact uh, there was another fellow who was a former attorney who was who received the same treatment and who was actually going to get shot dead only for an intervention from a leading Republican. He was going to get shot dead. And uh, I don't know all the circumstances, but I know he was beaten to a pulp. And um, this, this, this was the case. It wasn't always the case. It didn't always need to go that far. You know, a lot of these wee lads broke. After a couple of slaps in the face, you know, people have different levels of resistance. And whenever they broke, they were killed. Oh, every time. 
was none of this business. There's the there's the money to get the 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 the, the boat to England. It was none of that. If you broke, you were dead. It's as simple as that. And did he do the shooting? He shot two of them. He shot two of them. The reports that I'm getting is that he shot two of them himself. But Scap, Scap, uh, uh, that was at the very, very early stages. And then they'd have brought someone in to do the killing. Um, depending on what area it was in, some an area volunteer would have been ordered to go and, 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 and kill someone. But um, he, he, he killed two. Um, and his his modus operandi was him and John Joe McGee, or there's two other guys called Burke and her. They'd have went, they'd have, their job was primarily to break the guy, to get him to speak into the microphone, to admit that he was a British agent, to say what he allegedly had done. And then once they had that, they sent that to the Army Council. Army Council guy would have came along. And the, the the procedure was that the Army Council guy would have pronounced the sentence of death. Of course, unbeknownst to the IRA Army Council, there was an Army Council above them who were the real arbiters of life and death. And that was the tasking and coordinating group. They were the guys who actually sat down around the table and said, we'll intervene, we'll save this guy's life, and whatever else would turn around and say, fuck him, let him go, shoot, let him shoot him. They were the guys, they were the real army council, the IRA army council were not in control of this situation. The Brits were. So, but while Scapatici's doing this and he's watching people's death play out in front of his eyes, he must need some class of a personality disorder because that's what fate awaits him if anybody discovers him and I think his first interaction with the Brits was in 1978 so he's a yeah. long time well F- Freddie Scapatici was a classical narcissist mm. as I told you that he, he came under the room but when I say he came under the room he loved the idea of being the man in the big picture he loved the idea of being Everyone sort of way looking up and says, there's Freddie and how are you, Freddie, and everything else. And in natural fact, Freddie st- suffered from, I have it, I've actually looked it up, from narcissistic personality and dis- uh, a narcissistic personality disorder. Was that diagnosed? Yes. No, I don't know if it was diagnosed with him, but it's classic. And, and it's actually manifested itself whenever he... In 1989, the, the Nottingham squad lifted a guy called Sandy Lynch and he was brought to a house in Anadoon and he, and he was a special branch informer. He was an informer. The special branch set the whole thing up and um, he broke and Scapatici was heavily involved in his, in his interrogation and had been reporting to his handler the whole time in the various stages of it. And Danny Morrison went to the house, whereupon the Brits swooped and arrested Morrison and arrested four or five other guys, and they actually intervened and saved Lynch's life. Consequently, they they recovered a, a, a bugger, a debugger, one of these bugging devices where you run it up or down someone's body to find it if they've got a listening device. And, and inside the debugger, there was a battery, and Scabatici's fingerprint was on the battery. Which meant that they could place him in the room along with Sandy Lynch, which was which was very very strong evidence. Plus Lynch said that he was he knew Scabatici's voice, and the guy who owned the house actually says Scabatici was back and forward like a yo-yo. So there was a very strong prima facie case against him. So he went on the run. He was down living down in Dundalk. He was living in in Dublin for about two years. In 1981, he came back to Belfast and he was shunned. He went into a house and there was other IRA guys there and they were having a meeting. And one of the guys, one of the leaders said, what are you doing here? Fuck off. Get out the the door. You're not allowed in here. And that would have been an absolutely cataclysmic uh, blow 
Miss Gabatici. And uh, I say that, but I only found this out the other day. Uh, uh, I was talking through, I was talking this through with the criminologist, and the criminologist put me onto this. Now, he, what he said was that, and then Scapatici behaved very bizarrely. He, he demanded to see the, the, the general officer commanding the GOC, Northern Ireland, the most senior British Army officer in the North, and he demanded that he, demanded that he tell him that he's still important, that he's still, he's still the man, and your man did that. He also went to families of people. The Nutton Squad had been taken over by, another, by more different people. He went to the families of those who were being killed and tried to to and tried to say, look, I'm important. I was there. I was there when your son was shot dead. I tried to humanely dispatch him. He did that. He also had a meeting with, at the, in 1983, uh, there was a guy called Roger Cook, who's a reporter. He was doing a report on Martin McGuinness and the the, the, the dirt in TV. And Scapatici went to members of the Cook Report it's, and he, he, he gave them a whole a whole run down he, and he got in McGuinness. He, he put the boot into McGuinness and he, he just and, and he described the whole IRA general headquarter operation, etc., which was very bizarre. That's right? why it's so high risk. It's so high risk. And this, this is what brings me to what this... Uh, the, the criminologist said, he says, what actually happened was that Skep had a, a narcissistic collapse, what's called a narcissistic collapse. And this happens when a person with narcissistic personality disorder, MPD, becomes unable to, hold, to uphold their grandiose confident image due to a perceived fatal blow to their reputation. This leads to a breakdown which manifests as angry outbursts, irrational and defensive behaviour, and a verbal and physical aggression. Internally, the person with NDF feels a loss of sense, a loss of sense of self, along with uh, along with perceived rejection and abandonment. Yeah. And, and that is all there. That's, that's, I mean, Scapatici was displaying all of those, all of those tendencies, the irrational behaviour, and as you say, the very risky behavior of going to the cook report and he, he was so lucky because a special branch man happened to be talking to sylvia jones sylvia jones was one of the reporters for the cook report who had been listening to scrap teacher and she happened to say to him what was happening and the branch man went nuts he says you can't release it he's our he's our most important he was one of our most important um spies or uh, agents in the ira so it was hell she the cook report didn't release it mm-hmm. until 2004 by which time Scapatici had been outed. Look, it's extraordinary. And all that time, he's, he's playing both sides. He obviously feels like he's king on both sides, from the IRA and within the um, the intelligence services. But what's his normal life like? Is well, he married? He, he's very, oh yeah, he's married with, with six kids. Scapatici's got his life in order up until the Sandy Lynch affair up until he came back and he was rejected by the IRA. If he came back and, and went straight into the, the job that he had as OCA and Nutton Squad, he'd have been okay, he'd have been very happy. But because he was rejected, that's when he, he went off the rails. But he had a he had his life in perfect order. He went to work every morning. He had guys working for him on building sites. He had a in in the from in the mid 70s, early 80s, he was doing a fraud. He had a tax fraud scheme going, which was was bringing him in thousands of quid. He was a good family man. He brought his kids, you know, he looked after his kids, him and his wife, etc. And the kids went away holidays three three times a year. He changed his car every year. He changed house about at least three times between 1979 and 1980. He started buying properties. He bought a property down in Port of Ferry, a brand new big five bedroom house. So, and he was and he was held up there in in, in the higher echelons of the Republican movement and almost revered. So he had it all. As far as he was concerned, he had it all. And he would have had it all, but for the Sandy Lynch affair, we might never have heard of Freddie Scappa teacher. So Steak Knife, which was obviously his code name. Yeah. When does that start coming into the ether? When do people start realizing there is a Steak Knife? 
Well, in nineteen in nineteen eighty one, there was talk that members of the Army Council, or sorry, of the General Headquarters staff, Danny Morrison, secretly believed that someone was tightening. When he he was charged with the abduction and and kidnapping of of Lynch, him and five or six others, and they couldn't understand it. And they, Danny Morrison, sent word out: "There's a there's a tight in the middle of internal security, right?" And they were all suspended. And um, so there was a suspicion there, and the suspicion was actually that it, it was Capatici. Now. For some reason, and why did that fall on him then? I don't know why they suspected him. Well, possibly because Too good of this. To be true. No, possibly because of the strength. When you're in, when you're on a charge, after after some months, you go to in the court, the high court, and they have what they call depositions, and that is where the prosecution has to produce the case against you, and they have to produce it in court, and and. It's all written down, and everyone who everyone who makes a statement who has forensics or or whatever or any statements made by the accused are all put together and they're presented to the court, and the defense has to have total access to that. So they would the defense would have known about the fingerprint. They would have known that Lynch himself fingered. Capitici, and they would have had Jimmy, a guy called Jimmy Martin. He was the owner of the house, and he he mentions Capitici all over the place. All of that would have added up under under any circumstances to a very strong prima facie case. Danny Morris is no that no dozer. He'd have known this guy should be in that cell next to me. Why the fuck isn't he? So there was suspicion there, right? That it was Cap. So when Cap came back. In eighty one, after two years, and he was rejected by the IRA. And in my view, some people think he was still floating about. He might have been on the fringes. I have no real strong evidence of that. Um, there were guys at, at GHQ level who believed he was tight. Now they didn't move on him. They didn't arrest him. He came back. It was, it was even freaking strange. He came back. And he was arrested in the t- on a building site in the centre of Belfast. He was brought into Castle Ray, and he was interrogated by CID. And they wanted to charge him because they believed they had a strong case against him. And he, there was this rigmarole. He had to explain how his fingerprint got on this on this battery, and before he even came north. His friends in the Fru, Force Reaction Unit, the British Army, and a, a very senior chief uh, chief inspector of the RUC, a guy called Koski, came up with this ridiculous story that he had been doing electrical work in the house where Lynch had been held. And that's how his finger fingerprint got on the battery. Ridiculous. No judge would have accepted that. But it worked because they wanted him out. They didn't want him charged. No point having a third of his left up in jail, especially a third of his caliber. So it worked and he got out and it, the IRA didn't even interrogate him. Every IRA volunteer that went in the Castle Ray interrogation centre or any other interrogation centre was questioned when they came out. They were debriefed. What, what did they ask you about? What was your replies? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. None of that was kept at teaching. And why was that? Well... Well, there's a suspicion, unproven, but it's a, that's why it's a suspicion. The Scapatici has a dossier. Now, this was said by a, a, a fru, a member of the Force Reaction Unit. Uh, this is on a record uh, from him, in which he says that Scapatici had uh, an archive on virtually everyone in the leadership which had it been revealed, would have put them all in jail. And would he have indicated this over the years? No, this would have been hidden in the event that he is out it. This was an insurance policy. Now, whether that's true or not's another matter, 
I personally think there's some merit in it because he wouldn't be stupid enough not to have something that would, should the shit hit the fan, he can put his hand on and say, guys, don't even think of of, of, of clipping me. Don't even think of nothing me. Because see, if you do, is it all going to go down? Right? I don't think Scabatici, he would have he would have done that. The silver man among oh, the drinkers. Ab- absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. So by 2004, when he is outed and named as steak knife, Martin Ingram yep. uh, works with the journalist. Greg That's Martin. Ian Hurst. That's Ian Hurst. So he's outed as, where is he at this stage and where has he been? He's in Belfast. He's, he's, he's outed by Neil McKay, uh, um, um, what do you, the guy by Martin Ingram, what do you call Greg him? Harkin. Greg Harkin. And, and some others, right? He's heard it in the press as steak knife. And he, as far as he's concerned, he's just going to brazen it out. And it doesn't matter what the strength of the evidence is. As far as he's concerned, they haven't got nothing except a couple of journalists who are blowing their blowing their pipes, right? And so he goes on. He's done a big interview for the Honor Society News in which he says, bring the families to me of those who were killed and I will look them in the eye and I will tell them, I am not steak knife. I never killed your families, right? I never killed your sons because there's no women, there are daughters. I never killed your loved ones and uh, and I will look them in the eye and I will tell them that I am not steak knife, I am innocent. And he was intent on holding the lane and the IRA backed him up. Adams, Morrison, McGuinness, Jerry Kelly all came out and says this man is not steak knife. This man is a good Republican who has been the victim of the securocrats, British securocrats. So they were saying to the Republican, uh, to the Republican community, don't believe that this guy's a steak knife because uh, he isn't. And Somehow or another, this got to Sylvia Jones's ears. Remember Sylvia Jones, who who the who, Cook who, 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 the Cook report lady from ten years earlier. She says enough of this. She put the she put the tape on the internet, and she wrote a, a fantastic article in the People, and that was it all over. There was no coming back from that. Right there was everybody knew Scab 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 had a very very. Uh, distinctive voice. Everybody knew this was Gap. And he was saying, no, McGuinness is the guy who kills everyone. Everybody is going to be shot. They have to get the okay. We have to get it, get it up to Martin McGuinness and Martin McGuinness okay is the killing. That was one thing he said. And he started to discuss the whole England department where where the, the people who were, who were involved in the bombing of England, how they did it, who they were, etc. And the whole big detail. There was no coming back from that from him. So he then got the boat. It was his left. own arrogance then. It was his own arrogance. It was what you describe as this moment yeah. with the oh. narcissist when it's a the narcissistic moment. collapse. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's what done for him. If he hadn't of done that Cook report, mm-hmm. I think he'd be here today. We're still brazening it out. He'd be diving up and down that road, and and they and and he probably would have said, "That's all nonsense." That was proven to be nonsense. Look at me, I'm still here. He'd have been that it. So in the UK, where he goes to his life, does does it, the family stay? Well, the family doesn't go with him. Doesn't go with him. No, and again, again, this was this was the. This is a bigger uh, catastrophic moment for a I well, oh, I would agree. Yeah, yeah, because on top of everything, Scott was very oriented. Italians are anyway. But Skep was very family orientated. He loved his family, you know, and he had a lovely family. There, there were, this family didn't do anything wrong here. His but family course, were lovely people. If you take that narcissist personality, if we accept that that's yeah. what he has, they see the family as an extension of themselves. But if the family reject them, then it's yeah. shutters down. Yeah, well, that, that's what that that's what happened. If, uh, some of the family did reject him. Some of them didn't want to, didn't want to go near him. Now, uh, and some of them, to this day, well, to the, the end, one or two of them were still looking, looking for him, looking after him, and etc. But to all intents and purposes, 
when he left Belfast, he had a very isolated uh, life. Um, even in 1883, I think that he was he was attending um, he was attending the, the psychiatrists for depression. That would have been all a result of the narcissistic collapse. Mm-hmm. He he definitely had. I mean, I'm convinced. The more I looked at that, and the more this this criminologist described it to me the more convinced I was, this is exactly what's happened to this guy. It was just, you, you thought they were painting the picture. And, then, and as you say, in 2004, when he had the upstakes, leave his family, leave his work, leave the people that he had been associated with. He knew IRA men uh, as personal friends, and he knew he, he, he could have put some of them away for life, and he didn't because they were personal friends. And I, I mean, I interviewed some of them in the book who said that. And, uh, but that would have been a trauma almost too far for him, as you said, uh, going away in, uh, in 2004. It would have been awful for him. The good thing was, is that he had a brother in Manchester who would have acted as a bit of a prop for him initially. But I think he started, I think Freddie started to move about it as you would in those circumstances because by that stage he'd have been looking over his shoulder. Mm-hmm. Now, at, let me just see if I can find this. Yeah, 2018 he's arrested in the UK. Yeah. Um, on foot of the John Boucher investigation into what exactly went on. Yeah. Into whether or not... Um, Law enforcement, as such, knew that people were going to be murdered and didn't move in. Yeah. Um. And at that point, he's fi- found with pornography again. We circle back to that thing yeah. we spoke about at the beginning. Um. He's arrested. He's charged under his assumed name. No, no, under his own name. Under his own name. Yeah, he was arrested and char- he was arrested for having something like two hundred, uh, occasions w- when on the computer he visited sites that, that showed bestiality mm. and he was brought before Clark and Clerkenwell Court in London and he was given a conditional discharge because he really had no record. You know, although he was interned, internment you don't know it's not a record because you there's no charges preferred against you. Right? So he didn't have no record and he got a conditional discharge. And um it's interesting that because we spoke at the beginning about the kind of reasons that IRA men became informers. Yeah. And it was because of those secrets, those dark secrets in their background. And we spoke about a time when being homosexual would have been a dark secret. Yeah. Times have changed. Yeah. I think even nowadays, bestiality is something that is not probably accepted as norm. As of course norm. it isn't. Of course it isn't. Um, and, you know, it sort of sheds a bit more possibility on that, something like that being the original approach to him? Well, it's worse than that because there's a, there's a, one of the guys I spoke to um, was convinced that he had been, that he, that he had a, an unhealthy interest in underage girls and uh, that he had actually been involved, had actually been charged with um, attacking some under and this is all, this is all iffy because there's no solid evidence to prove this, other than what this guy tells me that he had been charged with it, and uh, certainly there was possibility of charges being preferred against him. If that had been the case, that would have been enough to turn him, because that would have been absolutely catastrophic. That would have been wailed. I would have been either had to, whether he was guilty or innocent, if the, a charge they got was preferred against him, he'd have had to leave the country. He wouldn't have been able to live in the markets. The IRA would have had an internal inquiry, right? He, and he'd have been in trouble. And who would work with him after that? And we can safely say that, um, I think, not being psychologists, either of us, mm. that he clearly had sociopathic tendencies that he could, you know, do that kind of violence on people, whether it was for a cause or not. 
and he was able to carry on regardless and have a normal life too and oh. have a family and absolutely yeah fairly kind of at half six or at half six at night put a put a recommendation in that Joe Black be shot dead and he would have left the house in which Joe Black was being held, knowing that on the strength of his recommendation, Joe Black will be shot dead and he would have got his kids and went to the swimmers. No trouble at all. It was business. It was like, it was like that good fellow stuff. It was just business. And that's the way he would have, maybe that's just the Italian in him, right? I don't know. But that's the way he was. Cancelled by every Italian. Uh, that's, uh, well, I, I, <laughs> um, I maybe suppose, he was a good fella. <laughs> yeah. I suppose um, in recent years, obviously, complaints and campaigns by families of some of the victims has led to this independent inquiry by John Boucher into steak knife and the activities, the kidnaps, the tortures, the murders, the alleged offences then by the British Army Security Services. Yeah. That report is due out. That report's due out. That's, that's a, we were ex, expecting it. Actually, I was led to believe that it would have been out this week. But it's the, clashing with your book. Well, the book, the book, the, the date for the book was planned months ago. And so it, if, it, if, it, if they correlate it's purely accidental but um yeah butcher's due very shortly uh, by the end of october we we hope and um the book will be the measure by which butcher will be will be gauged because we now know for sure that because families have said this and, and they've been told by butcher and not only families I have spoken to a very well-placed member of the legal profession. I have spoken to a leading journalist. I have spoken to a leading politician. And the whole three of them, unbeknownst to each other, this is all separately, have told me independently that John Boucher told them that Scapatici told his handler about every killing in which he was involved. And at the last count, there was 35. So if he told his handler, his handler would have passed, would have, would have had to pass it up the lane, and it would have went up to this tasking and coordinating group, and they would have let them die. And that's what I think Butcher's going to say, and that would be absolutely enormous, because here we will we will have a former head of Bedfordshire Constabulary, who was, who was, um, tasked. With looking into this, and the the, the the conclusion of which I think he's going to come out with, I hope he comes out with, is that British intelligence had it in their power to save the lives of at least thirty five British Irish citizens, and they let them die. That is powerful, powerful indictment of of the British. How did Scapatichi die? <laughs> So people don't even think he's dead. There are people who are saying, "Well, Captain Winters, I mean, uh, the leading the leading human rights lawyer, has taken a case, uh, has taken a judicial review to see to get details of his death because nobody knows where he's buried, nobody knows how he died. An announcement was made through Boucher, but Boucher Boucher was apparently told by MI five that he's dead." So there's no evidence, uh, no hard evidence of war, where he's buried, how he died, or, or anything else. So who was that? Who was was there anyone with him in the last hours? We don't know. So Kevin Winters says the families are suspicious that he's not dead at all. One guy said to me, I think he's in Bondi Beach drinking Fosters. Age 78. Age 78. And we wouldn't have put it past him. But nobody knows. And nobody knows if he was able to create a life outside, you know, this you've touched on. I don't think he was. I don't think he was. I think my, my, no, I don't think he had much of a life at all once he went away. I mean, the whole business of him being away would have been a betrayal of everything that he thought could have happened. I don't think this guy ever thought that the gravy train was going to come to an abrupt end. I think he thought that 
the security, the intelligence people will always have my back. I will always be safe. I can go ahead doing this. I can go ahead. I can continue to hurt the IRA and I, they'll always have my back and I'll always be safe. I don't think he ever for one second thought he would have the sort of collapse that he that he did have uh, on two different occasions. And I don't think he handled being away from 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 his environment in Belfast. I don't think he handled it well. I have this image of 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 him being like Osama bin Laden with a blanket over his head and a remote control, you know, totally isolated and alone. And he was pretty pretty ill in his last days, and um, he he told the court that he had had several strokes and that uh, he had been receiving psychiatric treatment from 1981 and 1982, and that the IRA were, were, were after him. You describe a kind of a hell on earth, and maybe a longer one than he subjected some of his victims to before they died. Well, he, he died with his boots on. You know, he didn't die. His victims got, got a were dead. Once, once Cap signed off on them, they may as well have been bits of uh, dust. He, the first he was concerned about was that nobody they were dead. Um, he, he got nobody got away with it all. Well, you could say he got away with it all. I think his last years probably were hell on earth for him. Ricky O'Rourke, thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome, Michael. It's a pleasure. You've been listening to Crime World, a podcast from sundayworld.com, produced by Ian Mullaney and edited by me, Nicola Talent. Research assistant is Claude Amini. If you like this show and love true crime, leave us a review. Or why not download the free sundayworld.com app for lots more stories from Ireland and across the globe. <laughs>